going to talk a bit about how we use uh, attention patterns, behaviour and circulation as a way of understanding how to tell stories in an age of, of digital attention. So to start with the attention patterns, um, this was something I became obsessed with when I was working at the BBC. I was there from 2001 to about 2007. And then I went to Channel 4. Um, and really it came out of realising in, in television how incredibly oppressive the schedule was as a structure for defining the way in which broadcasters told stories. And, and every, when I was at Channel 4, I used to go to commissioning editor weekly meetings on Thursdays and we would pour through the schedule and, and look at ratings and try and make decisions about whether shows were put in the right slot and stuff like that. And around this time I started noticing, particularly around cult shows that, like Skins, how you know, less important the schedule was becoming as a way of structuring our audience's attention and started getting obsessed about other attention patterns. But I also started wondering about the schedule itself and, and wondering about you know, why was the schedule the shape that it was. It's it seemed that for about 50 years, the assumption in, in broadcast media was that stories fitted best when they were organized in hourly chunks or part chunks of hours. And I wondered about why that happened. And it, it led me back to this, which I think is the earliest schedule I've managed to find. And, and this is actually a schedule not of a radio or television service, but actually a service that ran in the late 19th century in Budapest called the Telephone Hermondo. So in many ways, the telephone was the first kind of genuine mass medium. And before it eventually became a two-way medium, there were some entrepreneurs who thought that it would become a new way of delivering culture across countries and across, uh, across territories. And so entrepreneurs started a few services of what they called telephone newspapers, because of course, there wasn't metaphors around radio or, or, or broadcast at the time. And so telephone newspapers were services that you were subscribed to and you'd, be, you'd have installed a one-way speaker in your house, so like a telephone but without a microphone bit. And you could pick it up and listen to the, uh, the content being uh, distributed on the network at any one point. And so these guys, and it was guys, had this problem of, okay, if we can actually do this all day, what kind of shape should stories be? You know, how long should they be? And what kind of structure should they be in? And so they decided to organize their schedule according to the hour of the clock. And there's actually, if you look at one o'clock, a repeat, which is quite fantastic. So as long as we've had schedules, we've also had repeats. And then this is a structure that we've used to tell stories in broadcast media for the last 100 years. You know, this kind of schedule is exactly the thing you see printed in newspapers today. But this is changing, as we all know. This is some statistics from Forrester showing that, particularly with younger audiences, um, the many different competing patterns of attention we now have around culture. Um, and Netflix, as well, are also showing data uh, about how much we're binge viewing. And what's interesting to me is that the attention patterns we're seeing about different types of content are now shifting as much based on genre as they are about technology. So in other words, the, as we start to enter this world where we can find stories and engage with them in the way we want to, actually genre is becoming more important in defining the shape and the length of that story uh, than anything else. So the way we watch drama and comedy now is increasingly in these kinds of binge patterns where we watch multiple episodes. That's not necessarily how we watch news. It's not necessarily how we watch specialist factual or, or features programming. So in in many ways, the future of attention patterns of culture is based around technology and context, but it's also based around genre. And one of my bets would be is that it's that genre innovation that's going to get really interesting. But I'll talk a bit more about that in the second half. So the B of our ABC is about behaviors. And, and this is something I started doing when, when I was working at Channel 4, and we were commissioning from both digital and TV agencies. And I was really trying to get people to think away from platforms and technologies, and more about people, more about people and behaviors. Um, and so I started talking about the kind of things that our audience already knew what to do, and how various new technologies were introducing new behaviors, and thinking about actually behaviors as a way of structuring your story. Um, one of the things that really annoys me about some forms of real innovation in story telling is they assume that audiences are really happy to learn lots of new behaviors as a way of, of, of actually entering into a story project. And it's simply not true. You know, we are, we are incredibly uh, habitual beings now online. And all of your audience has a set of behaviors that they feel very comfortable doing. Uh, and introducing new behaviors to that audience is, is, is only something that they're going to do if they really, really value the story on the other side. But the really important thing about behaviors is, is basically how we've shifted uh, in the last 10 years from a maxim which really 
uh, only really stood in the first part of the uh, last decade, that actually behaviours online were, were organised according to this 99-1 rule. So 90% of people broadly just consumed uh, material from the web, 9% occasionally contributed, and a hardcore of 1% uh, were heavy contributors. And this is a power curve, and you'll see power curves like this within communities. But when we look at activity now across the web, this is a slide from the brilliant Holly Goodyear, who works with the... Uh, uh, a new media research team up here in Manchester. Um, and this is a, a, a slide, I love this slide, from a, a piece of work they did a couple of years ago now, where they actually said, you know what, it's not 99.1 anymore. In actual fact, about, only about a quarter of the audiences, and I'd say these figures have now you know, gone even lower in the last uh, couple of years. It's probably a much lower percent are genuinely passive. They just go online to, to find information and then go away. There's a much broader block in the middle who do what the BBC call easy interaction, the kind of circulation and sharing um, that Twitter and Facebook has made possible. And a much broader number, about 17%, actually are intense in terms of creating and, and, and uh, acting on uh, uh, their own information and their own content online. So one of the things we're really interested in when we're designing uh, story projects at Story Things is thinking, you know, what are the behaviours we're asking the audience to do when we design this story project? Are they behaviours that they are familiar with doing, and are they comfortable doing them in the contexts that, we, uh, that we're thinking of? One of the interesting things about that context now is that these behaviours are broadly happening within what Bruce Sterling has called the stacks. And I know that Alexis and, and Matt are going to talk a bit more about ecosystems and stacks and how to publish and tell stories within them in their talk, so I won't go into this. Um, but really the kind of tectonic plates of business model uh, development over the last five or ten years has been for companies to create these uh, kind of vertical structures uh, from storage through platforms, devices, social content, markets and advertising networks in which they're trying to keep as much of your behaviours in their stack as possible so that they can basically cross-reference your behaviour uh, against their algorithms and all the stuff that the guys were talking about in the presentation before. This makes it really interesting in terms of designing stories because you can play to the affordances within these stacks or you can deliberately try to create experiences that ask users to create uh, and share stories across those stacks. Um, I'm sure uh, Alexis and Matt are going to talk about it, but Facebook in particular at the moment is on a real push to, to be getting publishers to publish solely within their ecosystem, to not even uh, publish on their own site, but to publish stories and videos directly to their ecosystem to try and afford some of those behaviours that audiences um, are now you know, really, really mature and habitual with. The C of ABC is about circulation and, and really recognizing that the way culture gets big now, the way stories get big, has fundamentally shifted from the way it did in the late 20th century. So in a world of distribution, stories were big because people in positions of, of, of fortunate power decided they would be. So a scheduler would decide uh, to put a show on at 9 o'clock on a Friday night or 8 o'clock on, on a Saturday. A publisher would decide to launch a book just before summer or before Christmas. Record industry, the same kind of release schedules. And we're still in that world, but we're also in this world in which circulation creates scale. And the way circulation creates scale is fundamentally different and has really interesting dynamics to it. Um, this is one of my favorite books uh, to describe what it feels like to tell uh, stories in an age of, of circulation. And it's by a guy called Bill Wazek. And, and Bill kind of accidentally invented flash mobbing. Uh, he spoke at the Story Hour conference a couple of years ago, and it's a really fantastic uh, anecdote. But he got really interested, along with a few of his friends, like Jonah Peretti, who later went on to start HuffPo and BuzzFeed. He got interested in these kinds of dynamics of circulation in the early 2000s. But unlike a lot of books that try and explain to you that, you know, here's the 12 tactics you need to make things go viral, um, Bill tells you what it feels like. You know, what does it actually feel like to be telling a story that goes out of control? And I prefer that because actually anybody that tells you that they know how to make something big in an age of circulation is kind of lying. Uh, there are psychological tricks you can use in headlines and images. Um, there are kind of ways of faking attention uh, using uh, uh, bought uh, clicks and stuff like that. But really, it's, a, uh, it's, it's based on stuff that's nothing to do with you. Uh, things that genuinely go organically uh, viral or spread, to use Henry Jenkins' much better word than viral, spread for thousands and thousands of tiny little reasons that you as storytellers are very, very unaware of. And really, this is because circulation is essentially about fandom. Um, Henry Jenkins wrote his book Spreadable Media because he thought the word viral was the wrong metaphor to describe how culture gets big in a world of circulation on digital networks. In actual fact, he said that viral is wrong because, precisely because it assumes no agency 
in us as, as, as kind of people. So when you get a cold, you don't necessarily have any agency in deciding who you're going to sneeze on. The virus kind of temporarily takes control of some of your motor reflexes and forces you to sneeze. We don't share culture like that. We share culture with intent. We share culture with people because we want to say something about who we are. So Henry Jenkins tried to use this word uh, spreadable culture instead of viral culture to try and describe that. So I hate people who use the word viral uh, because spreadable is much more about what's going on. And so we need to understand why do people care about these stories enough to want to share them? What are the drivers, the triggers, the phrases, the kind of emotions that can actually get people to want to share your story? The other thing that's interesting about circulation is because scale happens in a world of circulation through recontextualization by people taking your story and reapplying it and retelling it, reperforming your story in their own networks, it's inextricably driven by transgression. Now, I spent about six years at art school, so I'm kind of aware that transgression is a massively loaded term and kind of vaguely understand enough Foucault to realize I'm using it in completely the wrong way here. But really what I'm saying is that actually Things get big because they are taken out of the original context. So in a world of circulation, things get big because people want to share them in their own networks and with their own friends for their own reasons, many of which will be completely different to the way that you perhaps originally designed the story in the first place. And this is what Bill Wazik talks about really brilliantly in how we get to this. Um, I use Ed Balls as an example for this because uh, he's a British MP who a couple of years ago uh, mistakenly typed Ed Balls into the composed tweet box instead of the search tweets box um, and sent out a tweet that just said Ed Balls. Um, everyone <laughs> laughed about it for a bit and retweeted it and kind of took the mickey out of him. And to his credit, he didn't delete the tweet, he left it up. Um, and for a couple of days, it kind of you know, got spread around the web and everybody laughed at him. And then he probably thought that it had died down. Um, and then the next year, on 28th of April 2012, somebody said, it's, it's Ed Balls Day. And everyone started tweeting Ed Balls again, and the whole thing took off. And it's been happening a couple of years, and even his wife has tweets Ed Balls now on Ed Balls Day. Um, so this illustrates two things. One is this really odd sensation. And if, if you've been part of a story that has genuinely got big through circulation, it's a visceral experience. It feels like this weird uh, kind of combination of excitement and fear. Uh, as something gets big for reasons that have nothing to do with you. And that feeling, that visceral experience of, of being part of a story that's breaking. John Ronson's new book about shame in the internet is really good on this. Um, I think is the feeling of, of what it feels like to make culture uh, in an era of, of, of circulation right now. But the other thing it illustrates is that one of the corollaries, one of the effects of, of telling stories in an age of circulation is that endings are really hard. If things get big because people are sharing them amongst their friends in their own time, in their own space, creating coherent story arcs that have a beginning, a middle, and an end that you can structure as a storyteller is a really hard design problem. So one of the things we've been focusing a lot at Story Things is, is design patterns for endings. Uh, we ran a mini conference a couple of years ago that we're gonna, gonna look at and do again, saying, you know, what are the design patterns for ending stuff online? Uh, we see loads of blogs from people telling you how they ran their project at the beginning, and occasionally a few people will talk about what it feels like to be in the middle of something, but you very rarely see people talking about ending something. And that's partly because attention is so hard now that it feels like a criminal act to give up attention and to tell a community that you're packing up and going home. And more than that, fan communities can decide that they actually want to keep your story going after you've thought, felt like you've finished with it. So I think we need to be sharing a lot more design patterns about endings in particular, because they're very hard to do in a world of circulation. So, if we're living in this world where storytelling is defined by these three factors of attention, new attention patterns around culture, partly driven by genre, uh, behaviors which audiences feel comfortable with and maybe only feel comfortable with in certain contexts, and circulation drivers, which means that your story will get scale for reasons that you may not understand as a storyteller, how does that change the way that we tell stories? So the next five slides are a few little bits of guesswork about how we might uh, do that, that we've uh, discerned through some of the projects we've been doing at Story Things. Uh, we actually have have done a much bigger piece of research for Channel 4 in the last year or so that I'm hoping we can make public soon, where they gave us data around 15 of their cross-platform projects, uh, everything from Big Brother to Million Pound Drop to Embarrassing Bodies and stuff like that. And we looked at TV data, social data, website, app downloads, and we tried to develop uh, seven potential formats for cross-platform storytelling on TV, and we organized them according to attention patterns, behaviors, and circulations, and gave kind of kits of advice about how to make these projects work. So maybe we'll be able to do that, but seeing as Channel 4 let me do that at the moment. I'll do some others, which may or may not resemble the ones that are in the Channel 4 report, but are presented slightly differently. Um, so the first pattern is the one that's probably most familiar to many of us now, and this is the binge. Uh, this is really, really dominated and changed the way uh, that people tell stories around, particularly drama um, and comedy now. Uh, we had Gary Carter, one of the senior execs at Endemol and Shine, uh, do a brilliant talk at the story last Friday, and he talked about this idea of genre shift in TV programming, um, and he, he was one of the guys that brought over Big 
big brother, and he said in the 90s there was a genre shift driven by technology that meant that suddenly it was cheap to record everything you could possibly record around a show, and that led to reality TV. He now thinks we're at the beginning of a genre shift towards scripted storytelling uh, that's going to be dominant for the next 10 or 20 years, precisely because of binge viewing and, and because of over-the-top services like, like Netflix and Hulu and iPlayer and stuff like that. That's changing the way that we think about telling stories. And it's not just in dramas uh, like House of Cards. Uh, Serial, in many ways, although it was episodically released, uh, was designed for this kind of binge uh, viewing structure. Um, and The Guardian has been experimenting uh, with doing uh, short plays that you can kind of queue up and watch uh, they did an experiment with the, National, uh, with the Royal Court, I think, where they put playwrights with some of their um, writers to commission short plays for their website. And they're doing a thing with Wynn Butler, I think they've just launched uh, from Arcade Fire, where he's writing a song a day about the news for them. So they're kind of looking at these episodic structures that create a series of content that you can binge. The second one is the pledge. Um, and Really, for many people, this is an economic innovation, but I actually think it's a storytelling innovation. So not only is the pledge a way of, of creating a, a community of investment uh, to help you tell a story, but it's actually changing the way that people tell stories. A lot of people starting Kickstarter projects um, are, are surprised by how much work you have to put in to engage with a community before, during, and after the success of a campaign. And the aftermath of a campaign is a particularly hard design problem, um, as everyone from Obama downwards has found out. Once you've uh, built a community around helping you achieve a goal, what kinds of stories does that audience want during that slightly invisible phase where you actually need to get the work done? Um, and how do you involve them in, in, in telling the story itself? I think we're only at the beginning of seeing how pledging as a structure is going to change the way that we, that we tell stories, not just how we fund them. Um, the next one is one of my favorites, and, and this is a really weird one, but really compelling for lots of reasons. Um, and I call it the Long Life Event. It's not a catchy title. Um, and this partly started out of some slow TV experiments that um, NRK in Norway were doing, where they were basically putting cameras onto trains and ferries um, and broadcasting for a couple of days at a time. But Channel 4 have been doing this in a really interesting way, uh, where they've been putting cameras up on, this is a show they did called Easter Eggs Live, where they put online cameras around uh, pointing at eggs of various animals one Easter. And you could view it online uh, as a live stream. And then every kind of weekend, there were, I think there was about a weekend of programming where they did a more traditional TV program about it. But what's fascinating about long live events as a story pattern is it enables you to have these two really interesting tensions in the way in which you tell stories. One is this ambient story that can go on uh, online in the background that you can dip in and out of. And then what happens is often these stories are based on events which are unpredictable. So uh, an event, a story event can happen in ways that aren't necessarily predictable from the storytellers. And so when something happens, people go online and tweet about it and like, oh my god, the egg's hatching. Or a friend of mine, for example, watched the London 2012 Olympics. He took two weeks off work and just watched it at home. And his Twitter feed in many ways became a kind of clarion call for me to go and find a screen because he would tweet saying, we're about to win a medal in kayaking and I would have to go and find a screen. So you get this flocking behavior where an unpredictable event happening on a long line live basis creates this flocking behavior where people flock to a story. Um, and I think that's a really interesting storytelling structure. The idea of a long ambient timeline punctuated by relatively unpredictable flocking events is really fascinating. Um, actually, the theater company Force Entertainment have been exploiting this with streaming of some of their uh, theater work. They've be, they do plays that last 24 hours, like 24-hour Quizula, and which are based on a kind of system rather than a script. So it's a generative system for creating uh, drama. Um, and it's really fascinating to dip in and out of a stream of a project over a day or over a couple of days rather than uh, necessarily sitting down in front of something for an hour. Um, the fourth one, we, we talked a bit about uh, earlier on in the earlier panel, which is basically about reports and using data. But I want to make a suggestion that actually the real art of data storytelling is about not having too much data, but just enough data. So just there is, there is this idea of just-in-time uh, logistics, where you get just enough infrastructure to deliver something. I really, really want to see just-in-time data, where rather than taking all the data, just because we can, we just take bits. We just really think hard about what data, you know, what's just enough data to tell the story we want to tell with the audience. So we did this as one of our first projects at Story Things a couple of years ago when we were commissioned by Faber and Faber to do a site for John Lanchester's book Capital. So Capital is a novel about the lives of a bunch of people in very different economic conditions that all live in one street called Peeps Road in London and how the financial crash affects them. And so we started by looking uh, at Google search results to see what kinds of words people were associating with their searches around financial crash. And one of them was the, this idea of the lost decade, you know, this question of whether England would have a lost 
first decade in the same way uh, that Japan did in the 90s. And so we decided that we would tell the story of the next 10 years of your life over 10 emails, one a day for 10 days. Um, and we used little bits of data to make that story more relevant to you. Uh, so in the first instance, before you sign up, we asked you to tell us you know, the date of your birth, where you were born and where you live now, and we used public data to tell you whether your average house price has gone up, whether your life expectancy is higher or lower, uh, and whether your annual income is higher or lower than where, you would, where it would have been if you'd have stayed in your hometown. And so without keeping that data, we told you a little bit of story that then got you engaged in it, and then we used data illustrations. We worked with James Bridal uh, to build some data illustrations at various points in the story that just told you little kind of gleaming bits of, of, of insight to the story. And then the final one, uh, which is really becoming dominant now on uh, mobile platforms in particular, is this idea of cards. So in many ways, we're moving from designing from the web, from a metaphor of sites and pages, to uh, a metaphor of apps and cards. And the reason for this is best illustrated here. You know, most of you that run websites will know that the majority of visits you get now will be from mobile devices. Um, and when we spend time on mobile devices, we actually spend very little time in the browsers as applications. We spend most of our time in other apps, whether that's games or, or in Facebook and Twitter and stuff like that. Now, those apps in themselves have many browsers built into them. But it means that if you're designing for purely an open browser experience, you're designing for about 14% of the time we spend on mobile phones. Um, so what these ecosystems, what these stacks are trying to do by building browsers into their apps is create worlds in which you share using a different metaphor than links and pages and sites. And the metaphor that they're all pushing is this idea of cards. Now, cards are little bits of content and functionality which can break off from your platform or story. And they're, they're kind of designed to be perfectly suited for these environments. So they offer functionality or ways of, of, of sharing stuff, which are not just about sharing images or videos, but actually sharing bits of functionality as well. Uh, so we worked on a project for Penguin around Griff Reese's American Interior, which was a film, an app, a book, and a uh, record. And we built the app for it. And we wanted to build an app that people could come back to. A lot of apps, people download them and never use them again, but we wanted something that was genuinely open to the web. So the structure of the story is based on one of the, rec the record, one of the songs from the album called 100 Unread Messages. And there's 100 bits of content, animated GIFs, videos, uh, audio recordings of Griff reading, um, images, stuff like that. But each one of them has a metadata around it so that when you share the message, it creates a deep link back into the app. So if you see a message on your Twitter stream and you have American Interior installed on your device, when you click the button, you go directly to that bit of the story, so you're deep linked into that bit of the story. So we're sharing these stories as cards and, and enabling people to, to come back into the app using this card structure. And these are now getting really sophisticated. So Apple have now, uh, with Pinterest's rich pins, you can now download an app from within Pinterest without having to go to the App Store. And Twitter are doing stuff like this with Sky Atlantic and Sky Go, where if you have the Sky Go app on your phone, you can have a record button on a tweet, which means that without leaving Twitter, you can set your uh, skybox to record a show for you. So they're getting really, really deep functionality built around these cards. And we're quite fascinated at story things about what this card metaphor means for the way that we tell stories now. So these are the five formats that I think are starting to emerge and some of the things that we're thinking about at Story Things. The binge, uh, predominantly driven around drama uh, and comedy, but increasingly being used in other factual formats as well. The pledge, which is not just about uh, financial innovation, but also about storytelling innovation. The long live event, this really weird structure where people can kind of follow an ambient behavior for sometimes days or weeks, and then quickly flock to particular unpredictable events as they happen. The report about using just enough data to try and create a compelling and personalized story without basically freaking the hell out your audience. Um, and the card, which in many ways, cards and apps are now shifting a metaphor for storytelling away from uh, pages and sites. Uh, so that's what we do. Thank you very much.